The case-by-case -case scenarios fueling the homeless crisis in Los Angeles are spawned from a plethora of causes. Even the most experienced boots-on-the-ground outreach worker will find new categories every year. Of course, they don't usually come as a single cause, but as clusters of issues. The few we'll be focusing on are probably the most critical and tend to create or exacerbate the rest. The first of which sounds to many like putting out fire with fire. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to summarize for you the meeting that I have just had with the bipartisan leaders, which began at 8 o'clock and was completed two hours later. I began the meeting by making this statement, which I think needs to be made to the nation. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. I have asked the Congress to provide the legislative authority and the funds to fuel this kind of an offensive. This will be a worldwide offensive dealing with the problems of sources of supply as well as Americans who may be stationed abroad wherever they are in the world. It will be government-wide pulling together the nine different fragmented areas where, within the government in which this problem is now being handled. And it will be nationwide in terms of a new educational program uh, that we trust will result as, uh, from the discussions that we have had. From our nation's capital, welcome to America's Drug Forum. I'm Randy Page. We depart today from our normal format to take the opportunity to speak at length with one of the nation's most influential thinkers of the 20th century, Professor Milton Friedman. Professor Friedman was the 1976 Nobel Prize recipient for economic science. He's a former economic advisor to President Ronald Reagan. And among his many lists of accomplishments, most recently, he is the recipient of the 1991 Richard Dennis Drug Peace Award for his consistent and controversial call for drug policy reform. Professor Friedman, thanks for being with us today. Glad to be with you. Let us deal first with the issue of legalization of drugs. How do you see America changing for the better under that system? I see America with half the number of prisons, half the number of prisoners, 10,000 fewer homicides a year, inner cities in which there's a chance for these poor people to live without being afraid for their lives, respectable citizens who are now, or citizens who might be respectable who are now addicts, not being subject to becoming criminals in order to get their drug, being able to uh, get drugs for which they're sure of the quality. You know, the same thing happened under prohibition of alcohol as is happening now. Under prohibition of alcohol, deaths from alcohol poisoning, from poisoning by uh, things that were mixed in with the alcohol, the illegal bootleg alcohol, went up sharply. Similarly, under drug prohibition, deaths from overdose, from adulterations, from adulterated substances have gone up. Milton Friedman noted that the two most violent periods of the 20th century when homicides were at their peak had a direct correlation between law enforcement and drugs. The first was the prohibition of alcohol. Uh oh There'll be no more scenes such as this. Barrel after barrel of prize whiskey is destroyed by government agents. It's going to be a cold winter for the barrel busters. The second began in the early 70s. It's no coincidence that three years after Richard Nixon declares the war on drugs, that Pablo Escobar begins to develop his cartel, which eventually turns him into one of the richest men alive at the time. Without this program, his venture never would have been possible. It paved the way. In fact, it would be fitting to call the war on drugs 
a critical juncture for a criminal empire. A group of cities have set up uh, the European Cities on Drug Policy. And what they say is, our national governments hold us down. We in the cities face the problem, and we must come up with different approaches. Not only has prohibition plagued many of the modern American cities with violence, but it has probably been the cause of drugs becoming stronger, more addicting, and more deadly. The theory behind this effect is called the Iron Law of Prohibition, a phrase first used by economist Richard Cowan in his 1986 essay, How the Narcs Created Crack, in which his conclusion is drawn that the harder the law enforcement, the harder the drug. The harder the law enforcement, the harder the drug. The inherent risk in the business of illegal drugs comes in two major categories. Storage of the product and transportation of the product. When these are your greatest risks, the best method of maximizing your profit is to make the product smaller and stronger. Each shipment generates more revenue and the product is now something that the consumer can develop physical dependency for, generating greater demand and allowing the supplier to charge an exorbitant premium. We've seen evidence of this throughout history. How, for instance, coca, an ingredient which used to be found in Coca-Cola, turned into cocaine. And laudanum, commonly found in most pharmacies, evolved into heroin one of our most destructive and dangerous illegal opioids today. The greater the risk, the stronger the drug, the lower the supply, the higher the demand. We are clinging on to prohibition and the war on drugs as if they were giant security blankets and, and that we couldn't live without them. I think we could live without them very well and control drug abuse and control crime much better by new approaches. But where is the relevance of any of this in respect to the major components contributing to the homeless crisis in our urban environments? Well, as it turns out, prohibition may be the most detrimental piece of legislation affecting more components to the crisis than any other aspect. I'm also proposing that we enlarge, enlarge our criminal justice system across the board, at the local, state, and federal levels alike. We need more prisons, more jails, more courts, more prosecutors. You know, I've been in Skid Row for two years now, and I've learned a lot about the people here in Skid Row. I now call them my brothers and my sisters. We're people. Yes. I ask every day, I question in my head, why? Why are there so many black folks living in Skid Row? Why? As Pastor Q said the other day, it's just another reservation that we've been exiled to. In consideration to race, the largest group of the homeless population in Los Angeles is black. It is also the greatest overrepresentation of a race. The percentage of black citizens in LA is actually lower than the national average of 13%. LA County is 9%, however they account for over 40% of the homeless population of the county. Black men are most susceptible to being victims of one of our country's most evil institutions since slavery. We need more prisons, more jails, more courts, more prosecutors. Is that proper? I think it's absolutely disgraceful that our government, supposed to be our government, should be in the position of converting people who are not harming others into criminals, of destroying their life, putting them in jail. I don't see, that's the issue to me. The economic issue is strict, the economic issue comes in only for explaining why it has those effects. Mm -hmm. But the economic reasons are not the reasons. Of course we're wasting money on it. There are 10, many. 20, 30 billion dollars a year. Show me what a police state looks like! This is what a police state looks like!
most often the case that a black male in particular goes to jail for several years for violating a law that should never have existed in the first place. When they get out, they have no skills or motivation and a felony on their record, making employment next to impossible. As if employment wasn't difficult enough to begin with for their demographic. Racial discrimination in respect to entry-level employment was well demonstrated in a study conducted by Deva Pager in her book Marked, Race, Crime, and Finding a Work in an Era of Mass Incarceration. The study went like this. There were two groups of men, one white and one black in each group. They were the same age and shared a similar appearance, education, and overall presentation of themselves. These men went throughout the Milwaukee metro region in search of an entry-level job. In the first group, the white man had no criminal record and the black man put a bogus felony conviction relating to drugs, not violence, on his resume. In the second group, the opposite was true. Now obviously the felon had a more difficult time getting a job, but only in comparison to his counterpart of color. It turned out that the white felon actually got more callbacks than the black non-offender. It's going to take a great deal of time and energy for social phenomenon such as this to phase out of our culture. The war on drugs is a serious burden, slowing down the advancement of that process. And oftentimes, this is where these men end up. And just as well, they may have left behind a broken home, a situation all too common, which just invites an opportunity for the cycle to continue. Police in our neighborhood deal with that high state of tension, you know, on a daily basis. I doubt that there's a more qualified and trained mental illness group of police officers in the city of Los Angeles than anywhere in the world. Right. Yeah. Another unforgivable side effect of this program is that instead of going after the counterproductive legislation and the prison system, the community blames the front line, who have no power in the decision-making process. It's almost as if they are a shield that the cowardly lawmakers use to deflect all the accountability. A drive to end prohibition should not fuel the mentality that law enforcement is pure evil and a blight on the homeless community. They are an essential link in the chain of rehabilitation when properly utilized. Solutions like this are far from the answer this would be more realistic. Los Angeles should have more police, less of a need for them, and a much smaller prison population. Criminalizing drugs can make the police a problem, but it gives them a problem they shouldn't have to deal with, and in effect, prevents them from doing their real job. If the system were rewired to function ethically and efficiently, the job of a police officer would be extremely boring. There used to be something down here called a special prosecutor. And what special prosecutors did were able to know the area intimately. So they could help identify which cases were more warranted more attention in the court. So um, a person that is a known user, low money guy, that's constantly going in and out, you know, and gets a lot of focus as opposed to the one guy that's actually doing the drug dealing and keeps slipping through. Special prosecutors knowing these, the neighborhood intimately working hand in hand with the police department will tar used to target, you know, the drug dealer, the predator, um, in a way that you take away that predator and a lot of the behavior, you know, will dissipate, right? You don't have those guys taking advantage of the population. Uh, and for whatever reasons, th those don't exist in Skid Row and in other neighborhoods anymore either. Um, so it's that type of tool, you know, that could allow um, law enforcement more power to police that type of drug activity um, which would then help us it's kind of hard to have a recovery zone down here um, you know in and around the missions people trying to get well people trying to you know whatever that is and then go right out on the sidewalk and have you know the option to go drink and use again it's a moral problem it's a problem of the harm which government is doing look i have estimated statistically that the drug prohibition of drugs produces on the average 
10,000 additional homicides a year. It's a moral problem that the government is going around killing 10,000 people. It's a moral problem that the government is making into criminals people who may be doing something you and I don't approve of, but who are doing something that hurts nobody else. Most of the arrests for drugs are for possession by casual users. Skid Row is one neighborhood, if you will, in Los Angeles where the gangs cooperate. There's no turf war in Skid Row. Equal opportunity. Bloods and Crips side by side, corner to corner, do not argue about turf in Skid Row. It's equal opportunity. You want to know who the drug dealers are, you go stand on a corner for 20 or 30 minutes and the best dressed guys out there. They're here all the time. The end of prohibition could be the most effective tool of removing the predators from an environment where those suffering from drug addiction are supposed to be seeking rehabilitation. And of those that are of the greatest risk are those whose substance abuse disorders are comorbid with one of the severe mental health illnesses. The proper role of government is to prevent other people from harming an individual. Government, he said, never has any right to interfere with an individual for that individual's own good. Look, if you really the case for prohibiting uh, 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 drugs is exactly as strong, as, as strong and as weak as a case for prohibiting people from overeating. We all know that overeating causes more deaths than, than drugs do. Why, can't, why, why isn't it perfect? If it's, if, it's, if it's in principle okay for the government to say you must not consume drugs because they do you harm, why isn't it all right to say you must not eat too much because you do harm? Why isn't it all right to say you must not try to go in for skydiving because you're likely to die? Why isn't it all right to say, oh, skiing, that's no good. That's a very dangerous sport. You'll hurt yourself. Where do you draw the line? Where this argument often gets distorted by critics is when they try to impose a straw man attack on its proponents. Their presumption is, so what you're trying to tell us is that drugs are good for you. Of course they aren't. Recreational drugs, for the most part, are horrible. They can devastate lives, crippling those around them, and cause a huge burden for their families and loved ones. The same is true with alcoholism, or the health issues that can be a byproduct of morbid obesity from an addiction to high fructose corn syrup, such as type 2 diabetes, claiming over 450 million victims worldwide since 1980. The claim has nothing to do with whether or not drugs are good. The claim is that prohibition has zero positive effects and a whole host of devastating ones. Just the fact that it provides the greatest source of power to organize criminals should be enough to take it off the books. But it also perpetuates poverty and exclusion from society for the disenfranchised because it makes the criminal option temporarily more profitable than the educated or skilled service. The role of the government is to protect the drug cartel. That's literally true. Is it doing a good job with it? Excellent. Why, what do I mean by that? In an ordinary free market business, let's take potatoes, beef, anything you want, there are thousands of importers and exporters. Anybody can go into the business. But the drug, but, but it's very hard for a small person to go into the drug importing business because our interdiction efforts essentially make it enormously costly. So the only people who can survive in that business are these large metal and cartel kind of people who have enough money so they can have fleets of airplanes, so they can have sophisticated methods, and so on. So in effect, in addition to which, by keeping goods out by, and by arresting, let's say, local marijuana growers, the government keeps the price of these products high. So what more could a monopolist want? He's got a government who makes it very hard for all his competitors, and who keeps his, the price of his product high. It's absolutely heaven. I would hardly say to anyone in law enforcement that they've been a wild success in terms of co controlling cocaine or any of the drugs. They've just got to face the fact that what they're doing, while well-intentioned, doesn't work.
at the local, state, and federal levels alike. The worst of these unintended consequences are the acts committed against impoverished families.